Our guest today, Dan Gelser, is the definition of someone who has done it all. He was an auditor before he went to law school. He became the general counsel of the SEC at age 35. He was a founding member of the board for the PCAOB, was there almost a decade, was acting chair for a while, was at Baker McKenzie as a partner for a long time, and now he's the board member of the SASB. I'm Brock Romanek, today on Zippy Point. So Dan, it's hard to believe it's two decades, 20 years since Sarbanes-Oxley was enacted and the PCAOB came a little bit after that. Uh, and my dad actually went to work for the Department of Energy in the mid seventies when that agency was formed. Mm. So it's pretty rare, Homeland Security. I can only think of a few other agencies that have been created you know, in my lifetime, but you were there on the ground floor as a board member so what is your recollection? What were the first steps in setting up an agency from scratch? Well, I, I, it was a, definitely a novel experience. I mean, just sort of by way, way of background, I mean, people may be aware of this, but the, the board was created, as you said, in the Sarbanes-Oxley Act in 2002. But it isn't a government agency. It's a not-for-profit DC corporation. So we had to create e everything from scratch without the assistance of the the general services administration or the you know the guidance of the civil service laws or pretty much a, a, anything else um so a, a a lot of the first steps in simply involved the you know the mechanics of, of creating a uh a, a, well I'll, I'll call it an agency it isn't technically an agency office space was certainly an early question i remember at our first uh organizational meeting we talked about where we wanted to be would be in new york might be better to be in connecticut like the fasb be a little farther away from the sec might be an advantage uh, but since most of us were living in washington we decided to, to stick with washington so then we we hired a, a, a real estate agent essentially and looked at vacant space in the, in in the district and eventually came up with the premises that had recently been vacated by arthur anderson when that firm collapsed which we thought was a kind of kind of a rich irony since the um the events that led to the collapse of arthur anderson uh were what gave rise to the pcob and now we would take over their their space so did you actually have all five board members walking around looking at at the space before I, you well we kind of assigned different tasks to different people and bill gradison and i did um office space location so I, you know i can remember bill and i walking around in early december of uh, 2002 i think on a day that was actually a snowstorm and so most of the city was closed with our real estate agent looking at looking at at vacant vacant premises and then when we did move into the the space at 1666 k street it had pretty much been stripped to the walls there there weren't there, there were a few offices around the periphery, which we as board members all, of course, claimed. And then there was a conference room in the middle. Uh, we didn't have much furniture. In fact, when we met in the conference room, you had to bring your own chair. So you'd have a place to, to sit. There was, there was a table in there. But just, I, again, in the, I think our first day of operation was January 6, 2003. And that was just a couple of board members and and personal staff so if the phone rang or somebody came to the door assuming they could find us one of us had had to answer the phone or or go to the door I and mean, there was just essentially nothing in terms of of resources so how do you um, talk someone to come work for what essentially was a garage band well that yes that definitely was another one of the early challenges was hiring um we er, Another thing we had to do early on was sketch out an organizational structure, which to some extent was dictated by the functions in the statute. And we also, in a lot of ways, tried to pattern the board after the SEC with divisions and a chief uh, general counsel's office and division of enforcement and that sort of thing. But so once we had the organization chart, at least in, in general terms, then we started looking for people to 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 be the core of the staff for those units. We took um, a number of people from the SEC staff. Well, then pretty soon the SEC uh, 
told us to stop rating the staff because uh, our salaries were considerably higher than government salaries. So it was an attractive place to work for SEC staffers. And the commission did not want to lose too much of its staff to us. Um, we recruited out of the accounting profession. A, a number of the important people we got, I, I think, had retired actually from the, the firms, which have fairly young retirement ages, and they wanted you know, to, to continue working in the PCOB was attractive to them. But but hiring was definitely an early challenge because given the sort of the whole background of, of the birth of the PCOB, it wasn't completely clear to people whether this would be a good thing or a bad thing to be involved with. We were told the people that owned the building were concerned that, uh, you know, maybe we wouldn't be around long enough to fulfill our, our lease commitments. It was, I think for many people who came who joined the PCOB in the early days, it was kind of a kind of a gamble, or maybe to say it differently, something they did because of out of a sense of of mission or concern for the, the reputation and the integrity of the accounting profession. And they wanted to be part of of, of restoring the profession's reputation. Yeah. So what other challenges during that first year or so did did you have that you think that other that those of us on the outside might not realize that you had? Well, I, you know, I, I guess one other sort of procedural thing that the statute provided that by a certain day after the enactment of Sarbanes-Oxley, and I believe it fell on April 25th, 2003, the SEC had to issue an order that the board was ready to function or capable of, of functioning. So we really scrambled to adopt uh, um, um, bylaws and operating procedures, for example. Um, have the core structure of the divisions in place. There was some dispute with the commission about um, what the authority of the chairman would be. So we had to, to kind of reach a compromise on that and, and work that into the, the bylaws. And we did make what, what we call the determination day, April 25th, 2003, had a little uh, champagne celebration and then went back to work. But in in terms of the uh, the early challenges, um, I, I guess I, I've alluded to one that, that isn't exactly substantive, but it was very real for us. And, and that was that we were viewed as having gotten off to what the press like to call a rocky start. And so there were questions about our, our credibility and even our our survival. And, and I think we felt it was really important that we, we try to address those. And again, I don't, you, you probably remember that period, but the the SEC had appointed as the first chair of the PCOB William Webster, and then it turned out that he had he was on the audit committee of a company that was under SEC investigation, and that hadn't been the commissioners hadn't been aware of that at the time of the vote. So Bill Webster had to resign after about uh, two weeks into his appointment, and that set in motion a process by which. The chair of the SEC resigned, Harvey Pitt, and the commission's chief accountant resigned, Bob Herdman. So uh, the, there was a whole sort of, I don't know what you'd say, aura surrounding us that uh, give, given the way we came into existence, we might not be successful. I know one of the, one of the Nader groups set up uh, what they called a shadow PCOB that was going to uh, you know, kind of critique any decisions we made and say how that they would how they would have made them instead that went away pretty pretty quickly but but again i i think we felt very much under siege in those early days and i think maybe that is sort of forgotten now by people who view the the pcob so i would certainly identify that as a as a challenge but you know turning more i, I guess to substantive or at least operational things I think one of the first major concerns we had was creating a registration system. All, all the accounting firms that audited public companies had to be registered with the PCOB by uh, October of 2003. We wanted registration to be automated. I mean, it's something you did over the internet. Um, and we wanted to be in control of the data that we received in registration. But we had we had no IT staff. We had no IT equipment. We, we had nothing. So we had to start hiring people that could do that and, and 
purchasing the equipment and structuring how the registration process would work. That that was just a major challenge in those days. There, there was there were thoughts about outsourcing it to the to the NASD or some other existing organization, and we decided we didn't want to do that. But it was really, I think we lost a lot of sleep about whether that registration system would actually be functional in time to meet the statutory deadline for registration. And again, I suspect to the external world, this wasn't something that any, anybody thought much about, but it was, it was crucial for us. Yeah, and to put some of these things in context, one, you started in January 2003, then you have this sign, you know, this dat the data point in late April where you have to get operational and then this registration, state, registration system up by October. I was launching my first website, I guess, in 2001. Just to launch a simple website, now you could do it in 10 minutes back then. You know, you had to find someone, and, and it was hard to find someone to hire, to hire someone to build a website because they were in such heavy demand. And it would take you a, a year to build just the simplest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And from our perspective, we were doing a lot more than building a website. You know, it had to be right, a, right, a whole process for submitting an application, reviewing it, uh, approving the application, and granting. We had sort of a similar challenge with with funding because, again, as a, as a nonprofit organization, we we weren't we didn't have an appropriation we didn't we didn't get money from the federal treasury except the treasury did give us a loan to begin operation i think we got a 30 million dollar loan but but in order to make the board independent the theory of the statute or the requirement of the statute is statute is that public companies uh, um, are assessed in proportion to their market capitalization to fund the board's budget each year the sec approves the budget and then public companies who receive their their assessments. So a whole process had to be set up to to levy those assessments on public companies and the statute didn't really provide much guidance as to you know sort of what what the what the process would be around dividing uh, the budget up in, in proportion to companies market capitalizations and should this really extend to the, the smallest public companies? There were, there were a lot of, we got that in, in place also and were able to re, repay the treasury's $30 million loan and, and go on to our self-funding um, um, status as, you know, as the statute envisioned. And another early question, again, I'm, I'm just trying to think of things here We'll, we'll turn in a minute to some of the substantive challenges, but things that may not have been so visible as issues to the outside. Another one I would identify is that the, we had to make a decision about how we were going to set auditing standards, because the statute was worded in a way that we could have, in effect, delegated that to, I guess, the EICPA, which was setting auditing standards bef before Sarbanes-Oxley was passed or some other private body. Um, but we thought that that would be f sort of fatal to our credibility. So we, you know, we made a decision that we wanted the board to set audit standards itself directly, and that we would establish an advisory committee that would, you know, talk to us about standard setting. But the responsibility would 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 rest with the board itself. Um, since I mean, two of us were accountants, but I. I the, the two of us that were accountants, Charlie Niemeyer and I, were really more lawyers than we were accountants. So I, it was fair to say there was nobody on the board with technical expertise in auditing standards, I, maybe Char, Charlie more so than me. Um, so there, too, it was important to hire a staff with you know, really you know, hardcore expertise in, in auditing. And we were fortunate to attack Doug Carmichael out of the academic world to be our, our first chief auditor. But those, you know, again, in thinking about things that were real challenges for us at the beginning, but may not have been so visible as challenges to the, to the outside world. I mean, the, those are the things that I would, that I would think of. I mean, there are certainly some other important substantive things we had to do early on that, that the outside world was, was well aware of. And we can, we, we can turn to those as, as well, but those are kind of my behind the scenes challenges. So Dan, what are some of the first substantive topics that the PCOB tackled? Well, um, 
I mean, I've already referred to to registration. There were a lot of substantive issues around registration. Not you know, not just the problem of creating an IT system and a and, and a mechanical process for registration. Uh, 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 there are questions about what information we should seek from firms. Uh, whether there should be some evaluation process, or you simply had to submit a completed registration form. There are questions around confidentiality. The firms uh, wanted confidentiality for some of the information submitted. I, you know, some of it involved things like we had, we had a pretty broad question about whether any partners had ever had any been involved in any kind of of, of uh, I guess law enforcement matter. And so you began to get things about people that had gotten a little tipsy in college and gotten in some sort of trouble or you know, things that didn't really seem to have much to do with, with auditing and the firms wanted confidential treatment for that. So that had to all be struggled with. But um, I, you know, I would say that the two big substantive issues early on were how to conduct inspections and how to report on inspections and then uh, an auditing standard around internal control over financial reporting, which the Sarbanes-Oxley Act required. Um, we, on inspections, again, at those very first organizational meetings, we decided that we had to conduct some type of inspection of the big four firms in the first year of the board's operation, uh, again, for, for credibility purposes. Um, so that required hiring an, uh, at least a small inspection staff. We, we didn't really do full-fledged inspections, I wouldn't say, in that first year, but we, we wanted to do something. And coming up with a, a, a plan, a, method, a methodology for inspections, and then maybe more importantly, or equally importantly, a model for what inspection reports ought to look like because again the statute didn't give us much guidance although it did tell us that we weren't supposed to disclose confidential information we couldn't disclose firm quality control deficiencies unless they failed to remediate them so we we're kind of left wondering well what is it that we are supposed to disclose there were questions about to what extent should we inspect particular engagements versus how the firm how the audit firm tries to maintain quality control and its in its practice. Um, all these things had to be worked out you know, in a fairly short period of time. We weren't even sure exactly what the target audience for inspection reports was supposed to be. Was it mainly a report back to the firm? How much was it supposed to communicate with the public? How much was it supposed to communicate with audit committees? I mean, all these things kind of had, had to be had to be balanced in setting up the inspection process. So that, uh, and that was certainly a major part of the effort during the first year. And uh, I mean, I guess the, the other substantive challenge I would mention, early challenge was, as, as I said before, s setting up the standards for the audit of internal control over financial reporting. The Sarbanes-Oxley requires that the auditor issue a, a a report or a, a, a test to the effectiveness of the company's controls. And, and so really, I mean, this was like creating a second audit. You know, we had a you know, hundred years of background as to how an audit of the financial statements was supposed to be performed, but nobody had ever had to come up with a framework for auditing internal controls and rendering an opinion on internal controls. So. I, I would say struggled with that. I think came up with a with a pretty good standard, but there there was, uh, and as you probably remember, great great controversy around the first year of internal control auditing. People thought it was too too expensive, too time consuming. The costs outweighed the benefits, and so the SEC uh, essentially sent us back to the drawing board to come up with a new standard. So we we had a process where it, the first standard was auditing standard number two, and that was replaced by auditing standard number five a year or two down the road, which in my opinion, at least has, you know, has worked pretty well now for the last 10, 12 years that, that that's been in effect. But, yeah, the first webcast I ever did, I joined the corporate council.net in January of 2003 was on internal controls and 
when Sarbanes-Oxley was enacted, the immediate attention was on CEO, CFL certifications, because those were required yeah. within a few weeks. And then there was five or six other things. And internal controls are sort of the sleeper in the background that people were too busy with everything else to really think about because that wasn't something that was required right away because your standards had been, hadn't been pro promulgated yet. But then, of course, that ended up being, it still is, the most important piece of Sarbanes-Oxley, particularly in terms of workload and, and significance, I think, overall. Yeah, I think uh, when a lot of people talk about Sarbanes-Oxley or the, the costs and benefits of Sarbanes-Oxley, they, they just mean internal control reporting and, and, and audit, and they don't even think about the other parts of the, of the statute. Yeah. So what are some of your fondest memories of that first year at the PCOB? Well, I, you know, there, there are very few, just, just the whole experience of creating a new organization from, from scratch. I mean, there are very few people that can say that, that they were part of building a new regulatory agency. So it was really, it, it was a privilege, it was a challenge, and, and I would say it was a lot of fun too. But sort of things like, I guess I already referred to tromping around in the, in the snow with Bill Gratiston looking at vacant office space, working out of the old Arthur Anderson space, uh, which, which essentially was just a, you know, a wide open floor in a, in a building with, with few offices and, uh, and a conference room in the middle. The, I mean, a lot of it is a little harder to, to capture. It's the, I don't know, the, the, the sort of the, the camaraderie and, and the sense of mission of the, particularly the people that we hired Initially, they, you know, they'd come from different backgrounds, large firms, small firms, lawyers, to some extent academics, people from the SEC, just brought together a, a very diverse group of people in terms of professional backgrounds that, you know, cared about improving the reputation of auditing, which had certainly suffered some serious hits from things like Enron and and, and WorldCom and, you know, and, and making a difference in, in investor protection. I, I guess I would have to say that that isn't a, a specific memory, but I think that's really what, what I view most fondly when I think back to, to those days. Yeah, I'm sure there'll be a number of reunions and formal and maybe a formal one. I don't know. <laughs> With the SEC, the yeah. older the SEC gets, it's, you know, there, there are, milestone events where people get together. Yeah. Well, yeah, I hope so. We, we've uh, uh, actually, uh, I, along with a couple other people, have formed an informal alumni association for the PCOB. We don't, we don't have an, as many alumni to draw on as the SEC mm -hmm. does, but we, we try to get together uh, now virtually or <laughs> in the past in person a couple of times uh, a year. And as the alumni group gets, gets larger, I think we'll be able to do more and more of that. I should put in a plug here too for the SEC Historical Society, which is, is in the process of preparing a, what we call a gallery on the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. And, and it will really, really looks in detail at the, the first years of, of the board with uh, you know, interviews and oral histories with, with people involved and, and goes into depth on what the challenges were of getting the PCOB up and running. I, I think that gallery will be open to the public in um, prob probably sometime this summer, July of this year, or somewhere in that time frame. And again, the, the PCOB's galleries are all all virtual. They're all online. You don't have to travel to the museum to to participate in it. So I, you know, I, I hope whoever listens to this video will will then check out the SEC's Historical Society's PCOB gallery. Yeah, the SEC Historical Society has a lot of great content, and and that's been up and around almost twenty years itself. So there's, it's really yeah, kind of a lot of traction. Right. I knew you've been very involved in in the society. Yeah, no, I think it's a it's a great organization. Yeah, thanks very much, Dan. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm.